Hey, this is Ben Kaplan. Um, welcome back to the Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon Speaker Series, our virtual speaker series this year. And uh, what a treat we have today. None other than the legend himself, the man, John Stanton, the founder of The Running Room. John, how are you? Well, we're doing great. It's, uh, you know, like everybody, we're faced with challenges in a changing world right now. But uh, in typical runner fashion, we're, we're all adapting, you know, okay, I, I that's, think right. that's uh, the, the nice part about runners. We learn to adapt to weather conditions. We learn to adapt to wind conditions and rain and, and uh, you know, uh, seasonal changes and uh, what have you. And runners are adaptable and, and they know that if they forge on that things uh, eventually work out. And I think that's the kind of attitude we have to have right now too, is follow the rules and uh, uh, stay healthy and look after one another and uh, together we'll get through this. Nice. And just so history can record, just give us a sense of the scale of your footprint. When was Running Room founded? How many shops do you have? How many clinics have you hosted? How many people uh, are out there today running around uh, thanks to you and your team? Well, you know, it, we, we started in 1984. And uh, I started the running room because I, I saw there was a, a void. There were lots of places selling running shoes, but people couldn't get advice. And the advice they were getting a lot of times were from books that were written by former Olympians and what have you. I wasn't an Olympian. I was just an average runner that went out and ran. And uh, although I ran uh, a lot of sub three hour marathons and I did the Ironman and what have you, uh, the only claim to fame I have is I went to world championships in the Ironman. But Apart from that, I was just a regular runner who had been a couch potato and took up running. And, you know, we were just converting at that time from miles to kilometers. And uh, those of us that are old enough to remember that, uh, okay. remember that a lot, of, a lot of folks that were coming to the sport were looking for information. Well, the information was written by former Olympic athletes. Uh, it was written in miles, not in kilometers. And, and a lot of folks were looking for information that they could relate to, that they could relate to the average runners taking up the sport and what they need to be aware of. And that's what we tried to provide. We tried to provide a resource center for people. And that resource center included our weekly run clubs, which is on Wednesdays and Sundays. It included clinics, which allow people to get clear, concise, collegial information because that collegial information was so important because it allowed people to share common goals and common achievements, common failures. And, you know, the errors that we make, we share with other people and we learn from each other. And, and that collegial atmosphere was so, so critical. Uh, the clinics were vital to, to getting people interested in this sport. And, and, you know, we looked at it from a selfish standpoint. It was good for us for our business because we created our own customer base. We didn't have to rob from an, another competitor. We just created new people to our sport. And, and what we did is we created this whole new wave of running. And, you know, when I first started with my walk-run concept, you know, people looked at us sideways and said, what's this about? Like, what kind of wimpy way is that to get running? But you know, it caught on. People realized that walk run is really like an interval. And when you talk to an athlete and say, are you gonna do intervals? They understand that they can go further faster when they do intervals. And you know, somebody who's trying to break three hours isn't gonna do walk run, but they're gonna do easy running followed by intense running. And that hard, easy routine is the basics of training. And that was fundamental in our developing our various programs that we had for, for the runners and allowed them to, to grow. And, you know, when people are getting ready to, to run the race, like many people will be this weekend, you know, throughout their training, they may have done walk run on their long, slow distances. You know, during the week on your shorter distances, you don't necessarily need to do walk run. If you can run five kilometers or 10 kilometers continuous, that's okay. But on your long run day, make it mandatory that you do that 10 and ones, because if you do, you're gonna find you're gonna recover better you're going to be stronger at the end of your, your training run. And remember, it's called a training run. <laughs> it's also called long, slow distances. And all we're doing is we're adapting our body to being out for an extended period of time. And by that extended period of time, your body learns to adapt to the rigors of training at that long, slow distances. 
During the week, if you do your long, slow distances uh, with the walk run, you'll be fully recovered. And when we ask you to do hills or ask you to do speed, you're gonna be fired up and ready to do them. If you do your long runs too fast, what happens is when it's time to do your hill workout or do your speed workout, you're gonna compromise yourself because you're gonna say, gee, I'm still sore and tired from my long run on Sunday and you haven't fully recovered. And then what you do is you compromise your training. You compromise, the, there's three parts of training, endurance training, strength training, and speed training. And you wanna follow the specificity, that's what coaches call it, specificity of training. And make sure that if it's a speed day, you're doing speed and you're, you're digging deep and you're running hard. If you're doing endurance, that means it's long, slow running, which means that it's agonizingly slow. That's what it, it does. It, it seems like, oh gosh, I should be running faster, but don't. Resist the temptation and put in the long, slow distance, put in the time and you'll find your recovery will be so much better. Strength training is about strengthening our, our cardiovascular system, strengthening our muscle system. And that way, we, when we enter the speed session, the rigors of speed, your body has adapted and gone through an adaptation phase and you won't get injured. I remember one time I was doing the Scotiabank uh, Marathon. I don't know, let's just call it 2016, who knows. And I was in with the three hour pack. So yeah. this is like, you know, we were runner runners, people that have been, everybody's a runner runner. I don't mean to say it like that, but I'm just saying people that had ambitious goals for the event. And we got to talking as folks do over the course of a three hour run. And I said that I, you know, I started uh, at the running room. I took the running room clinic and then later down the line, I actually taught at one of the running room clinics. And I swear out of my pack of 12, seven of them had a similar story. This is on a random rate, you know, on a, so that just made me think like, boy, there is just generations of runners that have come. I mean, what you've done in this country and beyond is just, uh, I mean, you have no peer. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's over 30 million people in Canada, and we've we've trained about a million of them to to become runners, uh, just short of a million. Uh, but you know, there, there's still a lot of work to do. You know, uh, ch childhood obesity rates are still uh, exponentially growing in Canada. Inactivity is growing. The good part of COVID, the good part of COVID, is what you see in communities, whether it's in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver or wherever you are in Canada. In the neighborhoods today, you see walkers, runners, people out cycling, you see families out together, you see husbands and wives out together. And, and it, it's created a nucleus for people to get into exercise. People who are doing Orange Theory or spin classes or going to groups at the Y or, or what have you in collective group environments, which are all good, but right now it's not appropriate because you know we, we can't socialize in larger groups. But what you can do is A, get outside, B, exercise, and stay within your bubble of that exercise. So you and your wife can go out for a run, and she can come on her bike, and you can run. Uh, you can take your children with you. And we can introduce exercise to people that, that maybe never didn't have time for them. And the good part about COVID is I think it's allowed people to reconnect with their family units or their social units, and they do it in a positive exercise kind of way. And all of a sudden you've discovered your neighborhood again because you're, you're going for a walk or run or cycle within your neighborhood. And, and that's yep. good, that's a good part of it. And what we've tried to, to preach to everybody is, is what the Health Canada is saying too, is that continue to exercise because exercise will, staying strong and healthy and fit will help combat you against the dangers of COVID. But keep your social to social media. So use social media and, like and for your social connection and use physical activity like running or walking to get out and, and to exercise. You know, I think we've all discovered Zoom and FaceTime and Skype and all the social media platforms. And, you know, many of our people who were meeting on a Wednesday and Sunday for the group runs, you know, we, we're, we're saying we, we don't want people doing that because you got to stay within your bubble. But what we're right. encouraging is people to connect on social media. And I can tell you there's all kinds of FaceTime sites now and uh, Skype sites where people meet at 7 o'clock on, on, on an evening uh, on Wednesday or 8 o'clock on, on Saturday or Sunday morning. And a group of them will say, okay, how far are we going to run today? And everybody goes out and runs their 8 or 10K or 12K, whatever it is. 
And then afterwards, they Skype or, or FaceTime together and say, nice. hey, how did you run today? Where did you run? I ran here. And you. So you have that social interaction. Yeah. You can share a coffee or a beer or whatever you want. Yeah. And, and you still stay connected with your friends and and uh, you have that social connection and the motivation from that you get from one another, but you do it in a safe environment because we all have to take this so serious right now. That's a great point. You know, no doubt that one of the good things is that I've talked about it a lot that almost like another running boom that we're experiencing now when everything closed and we were trying to get out of the house and, you know, Dr. Tam, who's wonderful and a friend of ours and a runner and she told people to get out and running. Here's my concern. We were doing this when the weather was warm. We were doing this when, you know, it made sense and it was bright outside. What is your advice? You've been doing this for a long time, coaching people for a long time. What do we do as we get into November, December, January, oh, February, you know, how do we keep the uh, momentum? Lust, yeah. How do we keep the momentum? What's your, what is your best advice for when it gets dark and cold? Well, it's reminiscent of when I started in business. You know, when we started in business, we opened on July 14th and uh, the weather yeah. was, and people came by and we started running and we started our running groups and everybody said, oh, this is fabulous. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then November came and people are going to say, well, what are we going to do now? But like, what do we do over the winter? Because I can't run in the wintertime. I said, oh, yes, you can. We'll show you how. And, and, you know, what you discover as a runner and Ben, you've run for years and you know this yourself is sometimes your biggest challenge in wintertime is getting your butt out the door. Because <laughs> once we get out there, once we get moving, we generate a lot of internal heat and we generate uh, our attitude towards it changes. When yeah. you're sitting inside looking outdoors and you say, oh my goodness, it looks so miserable out there. But once you get out and you run through the snow and, and you're the first foot experience through the snow, there's a sense of touching nature. There's a sense of accomplishment. There's a That's sense it. of achievement that comes from that. And for most people, if you use a 10 degree mark in, in Celsius, take 10 degrees. And if you, you think about what you're going to wear outside, if you think you need, you know, if it, it's uh, 10 above, you, you don't want to dress for 10 above. You want to dress for zero because, you know, that's going to be more what it's like when you actually get out there. And that means you have the right number of layers on. And, and to teach people, we can teach them or they can go to our website because there's a lot of free information on our website and, and they can go there and check and take a look at winter running tips. And we dress people in layers. You know, the big thing is to have a base layer that gets that moisture away from you so you don't get chilled. You want a mid-sized layer, which is a thermal layer. It's usually something fleecy that keeps you warm. And then you want the shell. And a shell is something that keeps the elements off of you, but still allows you your moisture and heat to escape. So it's a breathable fabric. That's what we call it. And if you think of a breathable fabric, the simplest way is it's like a cone. When it's woven in a cone shape, where it's small on the <coughs> outside, but it doesn't allow the wind and elements inside, but it's bigger in the weave on the inside. And what that does is that allows the moisture and heat to go to the outside. And you've seen it in the wintertime, somebody running along and they've got frost on their shoulders and they're, they're running along, but when you unzip them, they're nice and dry inside. That's the technical fabrics that are out there. And then we teach people how to run on the, in the conditions too, you know, simple tips. Like when you start your run in the cold winter day and it's a blustery windy day out there, head out into the wind so that when you turn around and come back, you got the wind at your back and you're not going to be freezing up. If you were to go the other direction, you could be in, in trouble, you know, run in loops sometimes, you know, and if it's, if the conditions are severe and you're a little concerned about your own safety, then run in loops, you know, so that, Instead of going out and back on a long route, uh, mark a loop that you can always take a shortcut and cut it short if you have to. You know, listen to your body. That's important. Make sure you know the difference between injury and residual soreness from training. Right. And we all know the residual soreness from training. That's when we kind of walk with a swagger and say, oh, I had a tough run yesterday. You know, I can feel it. And that, but it feels good. And the other feeling when you've been running and all of a sudden there's that sharp pulling pain, you know that, ooh, I better back off and back off, give yourself a couple of days rest and you'll avoid an injury. 
those are all the kinds of things that we need to reflect on and make sure that we stay. And then you're going to enjoy your sport. You know, the, the winter running is fabulous because, you, you know, you get out there and you really touch nature and you, you overcome the challenges of the weather as well as the challenges of the run. And it makes you more confident and stronger. And you can leave depressed as can be and come back rejuvenated and reflecting on how positive you feel mentally as well as physically. It's such a staple. I guess I don't know how many years now I've been traipsing around the country with you at various races and at various expos, and it never stops boggling my mind when I see the line of people always waiting in line to talk to you. And you always spend your time, you know, you never rush people through and you, you ask them and you have an uncanny ability to remember details about folks and, to, and to, to check in with them and ask them how they're doing. And you have a genuine interest in all of the different people that you talk to. I always find that so amazing. Um, I guess what I'm asking you is all of these different people that you've met over the years at these expos who come up and talk to you, who part of their race experience, I know I know three individuals I can think of specifically who tie in their race experience, I'm sure there's a million more, but whose race experience is picking up their bib, going over to say what's up to John Stanton and getting is their sort of, that's part of their tradition of their racing tradition. Give me a sense then for the folks that can't do this, what are these people all genuinely asking you? How can you right now provide these people with the experience that they generally get? What are all these people asking you? What are they saying to you when they come up and uh, say hello? Well, I think, I mean, many of them have become friends over the years and I, I know a ton of people and, and I know I'm pretty good with first names where I'll remember first names where I get in trouble. If somebody asks me somebody's last name or a full name, I, I get into trouble. But a lot of times I can remember Betty or Bill or whoever the, the name is. And I associate with, with uh, something that they've done in a race and what they were training for. They were maybe training for Boston or training for New York or, or doing something. And I say, well, how did New York go? And people love to know that you remembered them for that. And, and, I, and I think that's important that we, we respect each other as runners. You know, running is such a collegial sport that we yeah. respect each other whether we're that runner that's out there running a five and a half hour marathon or the runner that's out there running a two and a half hour marathon, each of us respects the other individual for the journey, the journey of training, the commitment that they make, the diligence of getting out for those runs, putting in those long runs, putting in the hill workouts. And sometimes on, on race day, what people are looking for is just confirmation and, the, and a positive affirmation that, yes, I'm ready. And, and what you need to do is somebody to reassure them and say, trust your training. You're ready. You're well prepared. You're strong. You're fit. You're well prepared. You can do this. And sometimes just giving them that little bit of a, a pep talk and reminding them that, you know, they've done their long training runs. And one of the most common questions I get asked, and it's particularly with new runners, is, is they'll say, you know, in your training programs, you say 30K is my long run, and I've, I ran 30K, but how the heck am I going to run 42K on, on marathon weekend? Well, it's the energy, the synergy, the fact that on the week you ran 32K or 30K, you also did hills, you did speed work, and you did all the other things. If you add up the combination of the kilometers you ran that week and the kilometers you're going to run on race week, you run less kilometers in the week than, than you did in the training week. So it's, it's again, reflecting on the fact that it, it's not the individual run, it's a series of runs that make it up. It's not the individual training run, it's the fact that you did strength training, hill training, and uh, speed training. And, and those things combine on race day that you put it all together. And, and, and then think of race day as a day of celebration, celebrating all the hard work you did in training. I mean, that's a great place and maybe we can sort of wind down, but let's give these people obviously what they're doing now, they haven't done before, you know, none of us, this whole virtual notion is new and different and you've been training or maybe your training hasn't been what it once was without having these events to sort of look forward to. So folks might be feeling nerves. I know my partner and I were talking uh, the other night and we're sort of like, I mean, if it's bad weather on the day that we we're supposed to go, do we still go out and do it? Or do you, I mean, there, there's less hard and fast rules in this new universe. I guess if you could talk to us about the virtual world that we're living now in these, the virtual Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon, which we should say is one of our country's finest. I mean, this is a 
legendary event, an event where history has been made numerous times. So we, I mean, I know what that is. I know the event, what it, what it means. The virtual event, you know, it's a little fuzzier. So I'm sure other people have some, some fuzzies as well. So how do you focus us for what this version of Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon really is all about? Well, there, there's both sides to it. There's a positive side and a negative side. It's like everything in life. And, and uh -huh. with the virtual, you're part of a virtual run and it's a Scotiabank Waterfront Marathon, which has a history of being successful and a high performance event. Uh, you know, you can reflect on the history of the event and see some of the success stories and review photos and watch tapes of the finish line and what have you and get inspired by that. The good part is you can also select your weather conditions because if you're going to run tomorrow and the weather turns lousy and it's pouring rain, you can delay it and run on, on Sunday. In, in a real race, uh, you know, actually happening in Toronto, you're going to get wet. Uh, yeah. You have the choice of, of selecting your weather a little bit because you can move that date around two or three days from, from your target date. The advantage in, in, in the uh, real race is you've got the cheering crowd and the energy right. and the energy of all the, the people around you. But what you need to do is get some family and friends and members and strategically place them along the course, your virtual course that you're going to run, and have somebody at the you know 10 kilometer mark, have that person hop up to the 20 kilometer mark so they can cheer you and give you a little you know, cheer as you go by and motivate you. Get a buddy on a bike. I mean, I remember running my very first marathon. I was apprehensive as can be. And a, and a friend of mine who had, had given me some tips getting ready for my very first marathon said, I'll come on my bike with you. And, and he did. He, he rode the course along the way and, and was all the way along on the course. And, and when we got with a, a kilometer to go, he turned me loose and said, away you go and see you at the finish line. And, and it, it's an experience I never forgot, you know, because I always remember that having that little bit of encouragement along the way. And it was one person on a bike that <laughs> periodically appeared on the course. And if you can have your, your soulmate or uh, somebody you know cheering you on at a couple of spots along the way, you can make it fun. They can make up some fun signs and, and what have you. And, uh, and again, it, you know, it, the nice part about technology today is you can also use Zoom or, or FaceTime or what have you. And you can be in Toronto, I can be in Edmonton, somebody else can be in Halifax. And we can all say, okay, we're gonna run and, and we're gonna do the Toronto Waterfront Marathon. I'm doing it in Edmonton and somebody else is doing it in, in uh, uh, Halifax or, or what have you. But it, uh, it allows us all to be part of, of what's going on. So. Uh, enjoy the process. It's a day of celebration. I mean, it's a day to, to say, you know, my training worked. Uh, you're you're going to have to work a little harder mentally. I can tell you that. In a virtual run, you're going to have to really dig deep to keep yourself motivated. You know, because a often in a race, it's that person ahead of you that you're looking at and you're running and you're sort of focused on their back. And then all of a sudden you, you think, gee, I'm gaining on them a little bit. Yeah. You know, or I'm, I'm falling back. And if in falling back, you pick up the pace a little bit. Yeah. If you're gaining on them. It's a, it's a confidence builder because you say, oh, I got to stay under control because I'm actually gaining on them. And, and it's empowering to you. So when you're running in a virtual run, often you're all by yourself. So then you have to play mental games. And my mental game is I, I have a fishing rod that I throw out and I catch the runner. Yeah, ahead. I like that. Mm -hmm. It's an imaginary fishing rod and an imaginary runner ahead of me, but it allows me to, to focus in on, okay, I'm gonna reel this next person in. And that deflection, that visualization of, of catching that person ahead of you deflects your negative thoughts to positive thoughts. You get your creative side of your thinking going and it reduces the negative thoughts that are going through to you. And that'll help get you through to the finish line too. John Stanton, everybody, a bona fide Canadian icon and a, just a darn nice guy. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I mean, John, anything else you want to say to these folks before we wish them well on their, uh, on their endeavors? Well, I wish everybody well. And, and uh, you know, if they have any questions, they can get me on FaceTime and uh, Twitter and, and what have you. And there's no such thing as a silly question. You know, ask the questions and get the answer to 
to what your training needs will be. And above all, have confidence in what you've done. You've trained for this. And if you're going to run the half or full marathon, you know you've done the work and training. But what you have to do is have the confidence to know that you're going to see yourself through to the smiling finish at the Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon. Go to runningroom.com. Everybody, good luck on your event. That was John Stanton. I'm Ben Kaplan with Iron Magazine. Thank you, everybody, and good luck.